for a long time, I have struggled with consequences from the narcissist abuse. This video is about the narcissist venom, which I consider to be the most difficult consequence of the abuse, to understand and neutralize. The narcissist abuse happens, in emotional, physical, sexual, and spiritual forms. It also happens in combination, or the totality of these forms. The more intense the form of the abuse, the stronger will be the venom. What is the venom? The venom, is the most sordid consequence, left by narcissists and their victims. It does not matter if victims have gone to contact, and live in the other side of the planet. The venom continues affecting the victims. Time also does not affect the venom. Victims may feel it, even decades after the abuse. The venom is the toxicity present in narcissists that hijacks the victim's capacity to develop discernment and self-consciousness. Without discernment and self-consciousness, the victim stays drifting in life for as long as the venom remains active. Sadly, victims may die without ever realizing the presence of the venom in their lives. The venom hijacks victims by keeping the victim's attention on the narcissists. Therefore time, distance, and if the narcissists are alive or dead, don't matter, in the way the venom keeps the victim's attention focused on the perpetrators, and the destruction they have caused. The victims only see the darkness present in their lives after the abuse, and they seem to be unable to let go from the consequences of the abuse. The venom gets victims to become ever more reactive to the trauma stimulus, that is now present in the venom. Therefore, the venom becomes the main triggering agent of the complex post-traumatic stress symptoms. Because the venom is killing the victims little by little, victims start to establish dangerous tolerance levels to it, making the venom less probable to be detected. Throughout the course of time, the venom hijacks the victim's self-esteem, discernment, hope, and a relationship with God. The venom slowly transforms the victim, in a helpless being, without hope with acute anger, and complex post-traumatic stress symptoms. I am the person, who is felt in the bottom of all I am describing here, even to the point of getting into coma. I saw no hope, or solution, to untangle myself from the consequences of the abuse, and from the venom. I have called for Jesus to help me with this situation, which I could not solve on my own. This journey has led me to finally understand, and neutralize the venom, Forgiveness is a fundamental aspect, for us to neutralize the venom, and let go of it. By forgiveness I do not mean forgetting the abuse, but realizing that I had to start forgiving myself. Finding healing through forgiveness is a process. Memories flash back, pain floods in, and sometimes they bring back the same reactions, one has had at the moment when the pain was inflicted. It seems forgiveness isn't taking place and we lose faith. Forgiveness takes place, when we choose to release forgiveness, each time we remember, and ask for forgiveness, each time the devil berates us, with contempt, over and over again. Often the most harmful grudges we hold onto, are against members of our own family, and past friends, whose transgressions against us, years or decades ago, are all the more painful, because they were people we trusted. And often this harmful venom, is buried so deep, that we don't realize how much it is harming us. That is, until we consciously, look it in the eye, recognize it for what it is, and decide to let go, and forgive. Choose to ask forgiveness, and release forgiveness, to take hold of your emotional healing. I'm including a wonderful sermon, by David Wilkerson, about forgiveness. I hope you find in your heart, an opportunity to consider the message of this video, and call for Jesus to help you with the power of the Holy Spirit. God bless you. Please remember, truth is freedom. The power of forgiveness. The power of forgiveness. Would you go to Matthew, the fifth chapter, please? I'm going to read verses 43 through 44. The fifth chapter. Uh, Matthew, verses 43 to 48. Beginning at verse 43, You have heard that it has been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thy enemy. But I say unto you, 
Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he makes the sun to, sh to rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For we love them which love you. If you love them that love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans or the sinners do the same. And if you salute your brethren only, what do you more than they? Do not even the publicans do so. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven, it's his, which is perfect. Heavenly Father, I pray that this message will transform lives and that there be repentance for those who are holding a grudge against someone, those who are living in a spirit of unforgiveness. And let us see and understand the power of forgiveness, how it transforms our lives and how it opens the windows of heaven. Lord, I pray that many, many will make things right in hearing the word of God today. So bless and anoint us and let the Holy Spirit flow through us. Anoint what you have given to us. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Forgiveness is not an act. It's a way of life. You can't pick and choose whom you're going to forgive. You can't say, well, I'll forgive you, but you hurt me too much and I'm not getting to you. We are to forgive all of those within our circle, all of those who come across our path. Over the past 50 years of ministry, I've seen the devastation of unforgiveness, how it creates bitterness and how bitterness becomes poison, how it poisons not only the individual, every member of the family, everyone within the circle of friendship. Everyone who knows of this poison, I've, I've seen it cripple people, literally, physically cripple people. I saw a man drop dead, literally drop dead in, in an ang, in a fit, a flash of bitterness and unforgiveness. It just overwhelmed him that somebody had reproached him, somebody had done him harm, and he clenched his fist, and he bent over the desk and died. I've seen the devastation of this kind of thing, this spirit of unforgiveness. But I've also seen and I have experienced the power of forgiveness, how it opens the windows of heaven, opens every closed door. I've seen how it takes a full cup to a full measure, pressed down, shaken and running over. I've seen it transform lives. I, I talked to a, a woman this past week and she was rejoicing, and her testimony was that for all her life, for many, many years since she was a young lady, she had bitterness against her father, who had mistreated her for years, abuse. And she could not. She's uh, uh, in mid-age now, and she said, Pastor, I have lived for years with this bitterness and unforgiveness from my father, though he's dead. And I, I, I couldn't, and he said, she said, it affected everything in my life. There was no joy. There was an emptiness. Everything I tried, nothing worked. My prayers didn't seem to be answered. And she said, I, I lived with this bitterness and it was mounting. But she said, recently I've been in the Word. And I've been convicted by the Word and what Jesus said and the commandments of the Lord about forgiveness. And she said, I gave that bitterness and that unforgiving spirit over to the Lord. And she said, I can't tell you the joy that's been released in my life. I have a joy. I can't get to my father. He's gone. But I thank God because I have seen the power and the joy of forgiveness. And that came this past week while I was praying about this message to bring this morning. Now, let me get right to the point. <clears throat> Jesus gets very specific about this matter of forgiveness. First of all, and most important... There is no merit to forgiveness. Well, you say there has to be merit because Jesus said, if I forgive others, he'll forgive me. If I don't forgive others, he cannot forgive me. Let me assure you, there's only one thing that brings forgiveness. There's only one power in forgiveness. And the only one thing that can bring pardon to, for, sin, for sin. And that's the blood of Jesus Christ. There is no other way. 
This is not a bargain God is making. This is not saying to you that if you will forgive others, you balance the books and I'm obligated to forgive you. It goes much deeper than that. You have got to understand, you do not merit grace. You do not merit anything. You have the windows of heaven open to you. It brings the favor of God. It changes your life and everything around you. It removes the poison from your system when you give it to God. But it does not guarantee you forgiveness. It doesn't uh, merit. You don't earn the forgiveness of God because you forgive others. Full confession of sin is the only way for forgiveness. And I believe what Jesus is trying to show us is the absolute seriousness of this matter of forgiving. And what he's saying, if you claim to have confessed your sins and given your life to Christ, but you held to a spirit of unforgiveness... You're really not my child. You have not really repented. You have not come by the faith of repentance. You have not come that way because you came to me holding on to that unforgiving spirit. So he said, I, I can't forgive you because you have never truly asked for full forgiveness. I can't do what you refuse to cooperate with the word about. He said, if you are my child, the essence of sonship that which represents being a true son of God is forgiving everything in your past life. Asking Christ to forgive you and you in turn asking or, or, or forgiving those that have trespassed against you. I read a, a story this past week, rather amusing. John Wesley was traveling from London to America. He was going to land in a state called Georgia for, cruci for meetings. And they were halfway across the Atlantic, and Gov Governor Oglethorpe <clears throat> was captaining the ship. Who was a wealthy man? It was his ship, and he'd come from London. <clears throat> and John Wesley, who was the founder of the West uh, of the Methodist movement, heard a racket from the captain's quarter, and he went up, passed, and the door opened, and Oglethorpe was screaming. At his valet, his servant, and John Wesley walked into the room and Oglethorpe was red and angry and had his valet uh, in chains, locked in chains. And Oglethorpe turned to John Wesley and he, he said, I can't forgive this man. Nobody has hurt me more than this man. I will never forgive him. And John Wesley said, what did he do? He said, well, you know, I like good Cypress wine. And when we left, I loaded up with a couple dozens of the best Cypress wine. And I just discovered my valet drank it all. And he said, I will never forgive him. John Wesley said, then, sir, you better not sin again in your lifetime. You better not sin. If I will not forgive others, he'll not forgive me. The captain got the message and released his valet reluctantly. So you say you can't forgive somebody? Well, then don't sin anymore. Do unto others as you would that others do unto you. And Jesus said, forgive because that is the nature of my children. You love and you forgive, Jesus said, that you might be the children of your Father which is in heaven. You forgive because that's the nature of sonship. That's what it is. It's a forgiving spirit. When you come to me, you come to Christ. Christ is a forgiving, uh, uh, is mercy. He is forgiveness. And when you have Christ in your life, and if Christ is to flow through you, it is, he is in us a spirit, a river of living water springing up by the power of the Holy Spirit, enabling us to forgive. Secondly, we're commanded to forgive our enemies. I want you to go to Luke, the sixth chapter. Folks, this is probably one of the simplest messages I'll ever preach, but I believe it's important. The, I want you to go to Luke 6. If you can see this in red letter, hopefully it'll make a, an impact on your spirit. Luke 6, chapter 
verses 35 through 38. But love ye your enemies. Is that in your Bible? Would you say this to me? Love your enemies? It doesn't say your sweetheart. It doesn't say anything like it says. And do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your rewards shall be great. And ye shall be the children of the highest. He's kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, you shall not be judged. Condemn not, you shall not be condemned. Forgiven, you shall be forgiven. Give it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure you meet with all, it shall be measured back again unto you. The enemy, as Jesus describes it, and here's his own definition of who the enemy is. Those who despitefully use us, who reproach our good name, who curse you, who persecute you. That's his own definition. Now, we have enemies in the world. We have enemies in the church. And we have enemies who are in the grave. And, folks, it's important that we have this this concept this knowledge this knowledge that the lord was not going to take any excuses whatsoever when he stands when we stand before him on the judgment day i'm thinking of of the hurt caused by divorce those who were once friends those who were once won and united and how divorce i've seen it over all my years of ministry, probably, and, and people said divorce is worse than death, worse than suffering the loss of a loved one. And the bitterness and the rage, even among Christians, the Christian divorce rate equals that in the secular world. And the bitterness and the divorce in many, many years of counseling and talking to those who've been hurt and wounded. This is what you hear. You don't know what he did. You don't know what she did. You don't know how he or she is trying to destroy me. I can never forgive. Never. What a chilling word to hear. If you only knew. And then when you understand the circumstance, you hear the story from both sides, then you realize it's the same old story told again and again by hundreds of thousands around the world. Your story is not unique. The Bible said it's common to all men. The things that you and I go through are common to all men. But there are people, there are Christians who don't understand, who've gone through divorce, and they don't understand why the windows seem closed to heaven. And they don't understand the confusion they're still in. They can't understand the, what, what appears a lack of peace in their heart. They don't have this good measure of the blessing of God. Filled, pressed down, shaken and running over. Men are not giving into the bosom as the word promises from the word of Jesus himself. But there's that, that, that spirit of unforgiveness. I will not let go. I cannot let go. I cannot forgive. And if you knew... And I hear that so many times. You just don't know. And that will not stand before God on the judgment. According to God's word, <clears throat> there are two aspects to forgiveness. Two. The apostle says in Colossians 3.13, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against anybody, even as Christ has forgiven you, so also do ye. Forbearing and forgiving are two different issues. Forbearing is simply this, a ceasing from all acts and thoughts of revenge. It is the absolute mortification of every thought of revenge. Like, God will get you. And every time something unfortunate 
Something bad happens to that one that you hold something against and something happens, a tragedy, something. Ah, I knew it. That's what they get. Oh, what a what a tragedy that is for the individual who has that kind of spirit. This get even concept that is so prevalent in the world today. Paul the Apostle says forbearing. In other words, don't take matters in your own hands. Don't try. In fact, the word forbearing itself means to put up with and leave it alone. Put up with it. Proverbs 29, 22, 20, 24, 29. Say not, I will do also to him as he has done to me. I will render to that man according to his work. I'm going to deal with this myself. When you go into, I think it's the first... For Samuel, you read the story of David heading off in a rage with 200 soldiers to the house of Nabal. Nabal was a wicked man, a rich man. He had over 3,000 sheep, and it was sheep shearing time. And David's men had stood week after week guarding those sheep. Of course, they were sentries looking out for the enemy, protecting David in his camp. But they never once stole one of those sheep. And David was with his his army and with his families and those that were following David hidden in caves and in on the mountains. David's people were hungry. And so he sent a few of his men to Nabal's camp while they're shearing these 3,000 sheep. And said, David to Nabal, David is asking if you could be kind enough to spare some sheep. Nabal says, who's David? He's just another servant. He's a slave that ran from his master. And these men go back to David and tell him the story. And David rages. I have never been so reproached. So help me. I'll get even. And David arms his men. And 200 men are here heading over the hills toward Nabal's camp. In the shearing, place of shearing, Abigail, Nabal's wife, finds out about it. And you know this story. It's very common. We all know this story. Abigail gets her donkey and, and some servants and loads it down with food and intercepts David. And David says to Abigail, before morning, your husband and every man that works with him is dead. And Abigail, in essence, says, God sent me, David, to tell you not to take matters in your own hand. Let God fight your battle. Leave it alone. You're going to regret. You are wrapped in the bundle of life with the Lord. You are walking in oneness with Christ. You're in the will of God. God has great things. You're going to be king of Israel. And if you do this... You may avenge, and you may feel good about it, and this is in essence what she's saying, but this is going to stick with you the rest of your life, and you're going to regret it because you didn't trust God to deal with your enemies. You decided to do it yourself, and you rallied these people, and you told them the story. They're all behind you, and it's easy to build a case for whatever your problem may be. Whatever your grudge against somebody can be, you can talk all you want to and build a case and build people around you and they take your side. But the moment you take it in your hand, the moment you say, I'm going to avenge this. I regret the day that somebody wrote something uh, uh, about me and I, I, I got so angry and I dictated a, a, a letter. This is quite a while ago. Dictated, uh, I mean, I was going to pin them down. And, and sometimes when I'm at, I'm pretty good at words. <laughs> Stinging words. I'm a writer. And of course, my secretary, Barbara, knows that she puts it away. Because <laughs> she knows I'm going to call the next day. 
and say, please don't send that letter. But I, I, I've known that rage. And Abigail says, no, David, you're bundled up the bundle of the Lord. Don't try to get even. And David then is melted and he said, Lord, you have pleaded the cause of my reproach. You kept me from revenging myself. And you know the story. Nabal died a few weeks later. He suddenly removed. And if you follow the story to the end, David marries Abigail. God took care of his enemies. You remember the story when David is sleeping in a cave and, and suddenly everybody's saying shush because here comes Saul who's been chasing David and he's men with him and he lays right in the mouth of the cave and David's hiding in the back of the cave with his men and David's captain turns to him and said this is God. He brought your enemy right to your feet. Now let's sneak up there and Saul and his men are fast asleep there in a dead sleep and his captain said, this is the Lord's army. Let me put a sword through him. Let me kill him on the spot. David said, no. He said, the Lord fights my battles. The Lord will avenge me. And he just snipped off a border of his garment and took it. And he woke him up. He stood at a distance and called for Saul and his men. And they were rudely awakened. And when this Man, Saul heard what happened. David said, I could have killed you. And he said, I snipped it. And David even later was sorry that he snipped off that piece of a garment. But what did it do to Saul? What did it do to his enemy? It melted his heart. And here you see this man, Saul, full of bitterness, full of hatred, trying to kill David, falls down and begins to weep and said, you're a more righteous man than I am. And that's why God wants, that's the power of forgiveness. It, it puts our enemies to shame because they can't understand that kind of response. They don't understand the love of Jesus Christ. And it puts your enemies to shame. Now, if they're demonic, if they're full of Satan, if they're given over to the enemy, they'll rage at you. But if there's anything of morality left, or there's anything of decency in a human being, it's called by the scripture heaping coals of fire on their head. That's coals of divine love that you and I are not are capable of in the flesh. Oh, hallelujah. Then we must forgive from the heart for bearing one another and forgiving one another. And forgiving involves two other aspects. There are two other aspects to forgiving from the heart. First of all, there's forbearing and then there is forgiveness. And forgiveness entails two aspects. <clears throat> Love your enemies and pray for them. Now, here are the four conditions of <clears throat> releasing the power, the divine power of forgiveness. Forbearing, that's making sure that there is no more revenge in your heart. Forgiving, loving, and praying for those individuals. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you. I'm reading from Matthew 44, and pray for them which despitefully use you. One great old preacher many, many years ago said, if you can pray for your enemy, you can do all the rest. You can love, you can forbear, and you can forgive if you pray. I have discovered that secret many, many years ago. And I've tried to make it a practice in my life. And I've seen how it has released so much of the blessing of God in my life, in my family, my children, my grandchildren. And everywhere I've turned, I've seen God do the miraculous. Oh, there's been a lot of suffering, a lot of pain. Just like every Christian goes through, but I've, I've seen 
what it's like when I begin to pray for those who have chosen to be enemies and begin to pray for them, pray blessing upon them and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? And many times God's had me give them offerings, write them letters and say, I am sorry. Forgive me. I've been on the telephone. Call and make it right. I've seen the breakdown and weep. I've seen the power and the release. And then after talking on the telephone or writing a letter and getting a response said I can't believe that you would take the time to to do this and I'm sorry also and and to put your head down on the desk and just soak in the peace of God soak in the sense that the Holy Spirit is at work in my life so that the time can come that you can't Name an enemy and you even pray, Lord, if there's somebody I don't know, remind me, show me and I'll make it right. That's what God intends. Love your enemies. The word there in Greek is not affection. It's, it's moral understanding. And what this means is that... I, I, I'm not, I, I don't have affection. It's not a matter of human affection. But a moral love that removes hatred from the heart, removes the spirit of revenge, and seeks ways to be Christ-like, and speaks no evil against the individual. If you say you're forgiven, you can never again speak evil of that individual. You don't rehash it. You don't talk it up among your friends. You drop it. You leave it in the hands of the Lord. It's a moral decision. A young man uh, just enrolled. I got this from, from the school, Sister Catherine's here this morning. A young man, uh, last Sunday morning backstage, she told me about this young man who's enrolled in our school, and to enroll in the school, you have to send a testimony about your how you got saved and so forth. And uh, I had the school fax me a copy of his testimony, and I was reading it yesterday, and what a testimony it was. When he was four years old, uh, his, his divorced mother, who had got custody of this boy and his brother, <clears throat> she one day packed their little suitcases and put them out the door, shut the door and said, never come back. And the bitterness, he was, they were sitting on the curb, confused and hurt because mother said, I don't love you. I don't want to see you anymore. Don't come back. And evidently she called the husband and he came and picked them up. He was four years old. For nine years, he lived in bitterness and hatred toward his mother. He said, I'll never forgive her. My mother didn't want me and cast me aside. When he was 13 years old, he went to a church camp and got saved. Truly saved. Started studying the word of God. Began to read about forgiveness. And he said the Lord told him that if he would start praying for his mother, he'd learn to love her again and God would change her. He began to pray for his mother. And as he prayed for his mother, a spirit of forgiveness came into his heart. He began to love his mother. Six months later, she was saved. And he's coming to school. He said he's called to be a youth evangelist. The power of forgiveness. Pray for those who have despitefully used and reproached your name. Pray for them. We must learn to forgive finally. And this is the hardest part. We've got to learn to forgive ourselves. King David, remember, had sinned, committed adultery, outright murder. Covered it up. It was full of, it's a, he was deceptive. And the Lord forgave him. He repented. Nathan, the prophet, came to him and said, Your pardon, David, the Lord has forgiven your sin. 
But that wasn't enough for David because, you see, you can be justified, you can be forgiven, you can be in the favor of God and still not have the joy of the Lord. Because you can have your sins brought out of his book, but not out of your conscience. Your conscience still comes at you and reminds you of your past sin. And so David cries out to the Lord, make me to hear joy and gladness. That the bones which you've broken may rejoice and restore unto me the joy of my salvation. David said, I lost my joy. And let me tell you, that is the consequence. That's the penalty of holding on to any grudge, any spirit of unforgiveness. Total lack of, loss, of, loss of joy. It brings spiritual famine, weariness to the flesh and spirit and mind. But David said, now restore to me the joy that I had. And God answered that prayer, and the joy of the Lord was restored to David. Years ago, I, I read the biography of Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor was one of the greatest missionaries ever to walk this planet. He founded China, Inland Mission. This is many, many years ago. He planted churches all around inner China. This No man was considered more godly than this man. He was a praying man. He, he was a wonderful man of God, faithful to the Lord, but he lacked the joy of the Lord. He, he, he battled, he said. He kept a correspondence with his sister in London, and he, he would correspond, and he said, I hate myself. I am plagued with thoughts that are not pleasing to the Lord. And then I fight so many battles in my mind and spirit. And he labored that way for many years in China, establishing churches, known as a godly man. And he was a godly man. In 19, or 1869, a revolutionary change came to Hudson Taylor. He came to recognize that there's only one way out of this despair that was in his heart and this lack of joy. And this battle that was raging in his heart. He said, I began to see that everything I needed was in Christ. All the, all the resources I needed, all the joy and the peace that I needed, everything was in Christ. But how to get it into my vessel is the problem. He said, I know he had and he's promised what I need to be fulfilled and walk in joy. And... I don't know how to get it into my vessel. He came to, it dawned on him that faith is the only way. That every covenant God ever made with man required faith. And that was the only thing that brought the blessings of the covenant into the heart, into the individual. was all by faith. And he'd been striving all these years, just striving and sweating, trying to please God. And he said, I realized that it's faith. So I tried to have faith and I kept pumping it up and trying to work it up. And I, I, I couldn't get the faith. Where is the faith? If faith is going to open up all the resources of Christ and those resources become mine and God knows that I need them, then how do I get that faith? And one day the Lord said, you get it simply by resting in my word. And he just laid back and he said, Lord, even you have to give me the measure of faith that I need. And I have to trust you even for the faith. It's trust. You say, well, that's faith. No, it, it's a resignation. It says God's word is true and I'm going to rest on the word. It's not faith in faith, but rest in what God said. And he began to quote these promises. Just abide in me, Christ said, and you will bear fruit. Just abide. Quit your struggling. Quit your fighting with me. He said, I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Jesus said, if you believe not, he remains faithful. He said, I've been trying to imitate Christ. And you can't imitate Christ. It's impossible. There was a famous classic written on that, but it's impossible to imitate Christ. You have to simply rest in the faithfulness of God's word. You have to come in to the knowledge of your sonship in Christ and what the cross has accomplished. 
you can't imitate Christ. You come to rest on his promises. And this is what happened to this dear man. He said, I began to realize that I'm dead and buried with Christ. And he sees me dead and buried at the cross where Christ died for me. He said, I've learned that when I sin to repent instantly and that I am forgiven instantly. I'm immediately forgiven. God has put no distance between repentance and forgiveness. There's no timeline. He said, when I'm truly repentant, I receive what God says. I repent and I rest in his the victory of the blood of Jesus Christ. And I have to now see myself as God sees me. Jesus says that, or God says in his word that I am crucified with Christ. His cross was my crucifixion. I come now to the victory that he won on that cross. And now I rest in saying, Jesus, it's pardoned. You said my sins are not only forgiven, they're cast in the sea, they are forgotten. Now I have to say it so. I have to reckon it so in my own life. I am clean. I am forgiven. And Hudson Taylor ended into arrest and he wrote to his sister shortly after and said, I have the greatest joy I've ever experienced. And I, in all these years, if I had only known that I could rest in the word of God and I didn't have to struggle. Now, if he said, I, I am capable of sinning as much as I've ever been capable. But now I've entered into this relationship that I'm a son, that when I need strength, he's made covenant to give me the strength. When I'm going through a battle, he's given me a covenant that the Holy Spirit in me will wage war against that sin. He's given me a covenant when I confess he's faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me from all my sins. Hallelujah. How do you wake up in the morning? I'm talking about forgiveness. How do you wake up in the morning? Is this the day the Lord really made? Why is it that so many Christians wake up now and say, oh, God, get me through another day, please. That's the day the Lord has made. That's the day we rejoice and be glad in it. What is it that condemns us? It's not the sins of ten years ago, five years ago, even a year ago. We know we've confessed and there's been time and we've enjoyed the blessing of the Lord since that time. But what about yesterday? What about what you did yesterday that has brought condemnation and guilt in your heart? When you did it, was there a pang in you? That, that pang of, of the Holy Spirit whispering, this is wrong. Did you have the sense of sin? Did you have the sense of, of doing something contrary to the Word of God? And if you had that sense, did you repent? Did you say, Lord, forgive me? And then did you call on the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, you promised to wage war against my flesh. I got in the flesh. I am sorry. Forgive me. Did you accept your repentance? Did you forgive yourself? We offer grace to the entire world and then sparse it out to ourselves. Afraid to forgive what God has promised is absolutely forgiven. I've got to move on. I've got, I've got a lot more here, but I want to just... <clears throat> My Bible says, today is a day of salvation. I could give you five or six verses right now that says that salvation is, is a daily thing. Today is the day of salvation. Whatever you did last night, whatever you did yesterday, if it's under the blood of Jesus Christ, don't let the devil condemn you or rob you of the peace and the blessing that is yours by the word of God. Can I tell you a little story? Uh, Gwen and I have a home in New Jersey, and there's a yard and nice trees. And uh, I, I thank God for trees, thank God for flowers, but I never saw them much. <laughs> I, I, I was always on a sermon or something, and I'll walk through a garden. That's nice. But, you know, last year, I don't know if it's my age or what, I, I'm loving trees and flowers. <laughs> I'm watering them. And... Uh, 
one of my associate Joey's in the service here this morning, and he helps me water, and, and I'm planting flowers. And I told Gwen, I don't believe this. She said, did you ever in your lifetime think I would be doing this? She said, no. And we were planting some things, and I noticed over in the container there was a, a, a little uh, broken tree. The stub was quite thick, and it was cracked, it was broken, and the bark was chipped, and uh, it had been laying there. I don't know where it came from. I don't know. Someone just dig it up, thought it was dead, and just laid it in this container. And it had a ball of dirt around it. And I looked at it, and there were two or three little limbs and about three leaves on it. And I said, there's still some life in that thing. And I told Joe, I said, I want to, I want to plant this. And Joey dug, up, dug the hole and got some real fine dirt, organic dirt, filled that hole with that, this dirt and put water in it, and then planted that thing. This has been a couple of weeks. And I, I go out every day to that tree. In fact, when we plant, I laid hands on it. <laughs> this is true. I laid hands on that tree and I said, Jesus, I want this tree to grow. I want no bugs. I want no disease on it. And this is going to be my tree of remembrance. I want to remember how you can take a nothing and put it in good soil. I put Miracle Grow on it every day. That's right. I hose it every day. Can you imagine if that tree could talk and it was sitting there? You know what to say? That tree would have said it's laying in that pale, unforgotten, everybody given up for dead. I can never forgive that man that dug me up and cast me aside. Never will I forgive. But you know what that tree would say after I planted it and watered it and put good soil and prayed over it? I even kicked bugs off the, not like this, bugs off the leaves. You know what that tree would have said? Look at me now. A new beginning. And this past week, I was kneeling by that tree. I even killed a bug that was coming toward the tree. And the Lord spoke to my heart. The Holy Spirit said, David, don't you understand? Look at the love and concern. Look how happy you are because you've seen three new sprigs come up. Can you understand the joy the Lord gets when he sees us grow? When he takes a nobody, a nothing, and puts him in new soil. And the word of God begins to fertilize that little broken stub. Folks, I want to tell, I'm going to make that the most famous tree in America. And that's what I do when I get up in the morning. I say, this is the first day of the beginning of my life. This is the first day of the rest of my life. I didn't coin that phrase, it's a cliche, but it's true. You get up in the morning, I'm forgiven, this is the beginning of a new day, what happened last week, yesterday, doesn't matter now, it's under the blood, this is a new day, I start all over again. Will you stand, please? I'll start posting pictures of my tree. My dear wife says, honey, what has gotten into you? Well, it's a, it's a picture God has given me to remember. Because, you see, we have some of those trees here now. Jesus likened us to vines and to trees. And, and there's some of you here, you came this morning, you're wounded. Something in the past has wounded you, hurt, and there's been pain and suffering. And how you respond is most important this morning. Please don't walk out of this building carrying, carrying this load. You say, Brother Dave, I would never take revenge. It goes beyond that, though. It's at the point now where the Lord said it's time.
It's time for you to truly forbear and forgive, love and pray. Have you prayed for those who have wounded you? It could be children, be on your job, it can be anywhere. I can't isolate that. I don't know what you're going through. But I know what this has done in my heart. The extreme joy. Everything that's opened up since the Lord taught me to forgive. And I'll tell you what, the Lord wants that for you. If, if, if the message has touched your heart, if you want to see this miracle, if you want the heavens open, follow these that are coming. Up in the balcony, go to the stairs on either side. And in the annex, just walk in between the screens. I'll pray for you. And we'll believe the Lord now to release you. And let you walk out of this building a free man, a free woman. If you're not saved, if you don't know Christ, come follow these that are coming. And maybe that's the reason you're not serving Christ. Maybe that's the reason you have backslid or grown cold toward the Lord. Because there's something now standing, hindering you. And you want to remove that stumbling block out of your life. You obey the Holy Spirit and come as they're ministering to you. You came forward. And it can't be your, your, your main object here is standing here before the Lord is not just to get the heavens open to you and the blessings. The important thing is you have to say this is what God said. This is what Christ said to do. This is the right thing to do. This is what I do if I'm going to call myself his servant, his child. This is what I have to do to walk in sonship. This, this is required of the Lord. It's his word. And the Lord, though there's no merit to it, there's blessings to it. And we want you to open your heart now and let's pray. I'll lead you in a simple prayer, but it has to come from your heart. It's something that... You've had to make a decision on your way down here. I will forgive. I will. Have you made that commitment? If it's more than one, let the Holy Spirit dig deep and find every person. Somehow get to that person. But you can't get there until you get here, right here, and settled in your heart. Until you know you've completely fulfilled the word of the Lord. You've obeyed what the Holy Spirit has brought to your attention. Now pray this with me from your heart. Lord Jesus, I can't do this on my own strength. I need the Holy Spirit. I believe you and I trust you to make it possible for me to obey. Forgive me, Lord Jesus, for carrying this so long. And by faith, I lay it down. Forgive me, Jesus. And cleanse me. Now help me to truly forgive. Remind me to pray for all of these who have offended me. Now let me pray for you. Father, I've seen over many years of preaching and ministering that you're more ready to give than we are to receive. That your heart is open to a cry. And we're so weak. We make promises. Uh, we say we'll do things and we mean it to the best of our ability and then we fail. But Lord, you have made provision. You've given us promises that if we ask in faith, you will do it. You will give us the strength. And Holy Spirit, we call upon you right now. To, to have people that have come forward just to rest now and say, Holy Spirit, I'm going to turn this over to your hands. Show me how. And don't let me forget this. When I walk out the door, remind me at the door. Remind me when I get in the car. Remind me when I get home. Remind me. And Lord, I pray that everyone's here now will take it home and go and pray over it. Pray about what is being said by the Holy Spirit. And Lord, you said you'll give us direction. You'll tell us how. Lord Jesus, let there be life changes. We believe you and we thank you. Lord, for those that have come to renew their walk with you, coming to repent, Lord, hear that cry. Sometimes it's not even an audible cry, but there's a groaning inside, that groaning towards you. Hear it 
Holy Spirit, and answer, we pray in Christ's name. Will you thank the Lord right now that he's been faithful to you to speak? We thank you, Holy Spirit. I would hope that if this is your home church and you worship here, I would hope that you would go to somebody, if you know anyone in this body, that you have something you've been holding against them. I would trust that the Holy Spirit has spoken clear enough that you would make, make it a point to get to them and say to their face, I've held a grudge or I have something. Make sure that if you've had something against somebody, go to them and say what it is and say, pray with me. God, give me the right spirit. Lord, I'm asking you to release the power of forgiveness in everyone who hears the word this morning. And as it goes out on the Internet, when it goes out on the tapes, Lord, let there be much restoring power released in Christ's name. Amen.